All financial support for this podcast comes from my patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to join in with the patrons, please check out patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. That's D-A-R-W-I-N-G-R-O-S-S-E. Now enjoy the podcast. Okay, this morning I have the great pleasure to talk to someone uh, who I actually learned uh, learned most about through some uh, press releases from Mute Records. His name's Simon Fisher Turner. And uh, the thing that caught my attention was a collaboration that, when you hear this, will have just come out uh, with the ceramicist uh, Edmund DeWalt. And so I got a chance to listen to it, and then I dove into his work, and a phenomenal body of work. I, I was blown away. And so uh, I was I reached out to the folks at Mute, and they hooked me up with Simon, and so we're going to have a chance to talk to Simon Fisher-Turner this morning. Hey, Simon, how's it going? Good, good, good. Thank you. It's um, it's raining hard outside here in <laughs> in London, and it's yes, it's been raining all day. It's pretty English, but it, things are going very well. Sir. <laughs> That's it. Sounds like so very English indeed. So, as I mentioned, this collaboration that you did with Emma Dewald really caught my attention, and when I heard it, um, I got a chance to listen to some of the pre-release work. I was blown away. Because it's sort of like this beautiful mishmash of like field recording, but composed sound, and I, I, it was just gorgeous. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, about the details of that recording? How you collaborated with Edmund, and and what what is sort of the backbone of this recording? Okay, well, well, the backbone of it, uh, there were a few things. The, the sound of Edmund's ceramics, um, he makes these very intricate vessels out of porcelain, and he's a real porcelain expert, and um, he's known for his writing as well as his, his art, as it were. And I got a phone call from somebody saying, a friend saying, would I be interested in working with a ceramicist for an exhibition in Los Angeles? And of course, being the sort of positive dude, I... Am I suppose I went, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> and Edmund phoned up, and then, of course, I'd remembered that he'd also uh, written a rather brilliant book about his family called A Hair with Amber Eyes, which was really an extraordinary journey, which, yeah, it's, it's about his, his relatives from the, the long lost past. And he's very interesting, and he popped around to see me in London, which was very gracious of him and um we sort of he he asked me if i'd like to collaborate and i said yes and so the first thing he said to me actually was in fact would you like to come to vienna with me for a few days and record where this this gentleman schindler um lived and he he just started talking and he opened up to me totally about how he was feeling about the project about where it was going to be in los angeles at the schindler house and we got on like a house on fire really you know bash bash the, the idea around the car park, really, as it were. And um, I, f I suppose a couple of months later, we flew off to Vienna together for a night and spent a couple of days in Vienna just recording what people call them, um, uh, field recordings. But I, I didn't really call them field recordings. Just recording the city, recording the sounds. I mean, I'd, I've been to Vienna before and um, didn't have a very great time there, actually, when I was a teenager. So it was a delight to go with Edmund who showed me all sorts of places. And I have a little digital recorder with me, and I just record the heck out of whatever I'm doing, and my ears sort of lead me lead me to where we're going. And Edmund had a list of where he wanted me to record. And the idea was to see if I could just record, a, compile a whole lot of recordings from the city, which were specific in his mind to the project, and then mess around with them later so that that's the first thing so i'm just i mean i'm, I'm a recorder or I'm, I'm like a kind of human tape recorder to a certain extent <laughs> okay and these days with digital stuff it's great i mean generally it works wonderfully it actually did work wonderfully and um i got very lucky we saw what we needed to see 
And then we came back to London and the idea was to, well, the idea was to just see if I could make something. The great thing about Edmund was initially that he didn't actually really expect anything. Mm. And he didn't necessarily expect anything to work. It didn't matter if it didn't work. We both agreed that it was going to be nice to spend some time together sure. and, you know, while away a couple of days in Vienna, just poodling around, really, having nice lunch, uh, pottering around. And so that's that's really what we did. And and I came back to work in London and immediately got at it and started to delve into these recordings and see what I could get out of them. And that was the initial the, the initial process is that let's say that that was my instrument to start with the city of Vienna. Sure. And then the and then and then the penny dropped when I was over at Edmund's studio one day and uh, we were having lunch, and I suddenly realised that uh, oh I know what happened no he bought a he he bought a, a broken vessel which is about three two and a half three inches high a broken and bits of shards and he rolled it on the table and I don't know if you know how if you roll something which is is imperfect it rocks from side to side and mm-hmm. the speed gets faster and faster and faster. And it gets quieter and quieter and quieter as that happens. Uh, so, the I think I heard. Dropped. I think I heard that in the recording. There was that one. Exactly. There was a, it very much jumps out as this beautiful transition point, right? You will find these scattered through the recordings in one way or another. It may just be a simple. So anyway, that was the sort of gateway because I looked at Edmund in astonishment ran around the studio picking up broken bits of porcelain, popping them into a little tray and then disappearing into his storeroom for about 45 (laughs) minutes. I came out 45 minutes later having dropped, thrown, twisted, rolled, all sorts of bits of porcelain. Number two, I was a happy, happy little cat now. I was very, very happy. (laughs) So that's instrument number two. So that's, for my money, I've I've got all the instruments I need because I've got right. I'm going to I've started processing the sounds of Vienna, then I've got Edmund, and then I started processing what Edmund had done, and I suddenly realised, of course, that that was pretty stupid processing Edmund's work. So I decided <laughs> to keep I, I I decided to keep Edmund's work completely pure, and then I started getting really really pernickety about the pieces I wanted to use. And then, and I wasn't quite sure how to use them either. I mean, the whole thing was going very slowly, getting all this together. And I was in no hurry, but I wanted it to take its time. And so, for instance, that was number two. So I knew I wanted to do that. And Edmund thought that was a good idea. We we quite liked the idea of me attempting to make something of these two positions now. And then, basically, that went on for quite some time. And the, the pieces of music I made from the Viennese tapes it started maybe uh, the, the compilation. The first one was about five minutes long. The second one was probably about ten or twelve minutes long. And as as I went along, I started building up a sort of symphony of the city, or a kind of travelogue in my mind of of a sort of journey, which I thought would work. Then to then place these fragments of Edmund's vessels on top of. I was getting a getting a shape which which was beginning to make sense to me, and I'd go back and forth to Edmund's studio, and f- we'd go through what I was playing and making, and he would uh, then say what he liked and didn't like. So we were really sure. collaborating closely, which was okay. very good. Mm-hmm. And then I realised that all the pieces I'd recorded with Edmund, with the quality, just wasn't good enough. And so I then went to a a really lovely recording studio in London here, which I use, and um, went into a very quiet environment and suddenly started recording again all the bits and bobs of of the rolling fragments and dropping tiny pieces of white porcelain. And because they're so small, there's something about them, because I've no idea why, but I guess it's because the, the dust is so fine, the porcelain dust is so fine, that the frequency that they sort of, well, the frequencies are so high, it's, it's almost impossible for me to record them at home. Right, right. So that was a problem, but then it was solved by doing that. And then the third part is once we'd actually made the whole piece and we were satisfied with it, we, we went to Los Angeles, installed the installation, but then while I was there, I started recording again, and then some of the stuff from that, actually from the Schindler House, went into making a sort of extra version because I was determined by then to make an album of it okay. because I didn't really want to waste this 
this opportunity. <laughs> That's beautiful work, right? Was, yeah. It was it was a it was a good thing, and I definitely wanted to turn it into a record for Mute, particularly specifically for Daniel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should uh, specify that this was the relationship of all these things was you working with Edmund Wall as yeah. part of an installation. It was an installation in the Schindler House in L.A., yes. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so that's how that tied all together. It's really kind of fascinating the way that you actually sort of, uh, you know, by going to Vienna, you almost kind of like walked the history of the house, but also walking the history of the development of this installation. There's sort of like a lot yeah. of different trails you followed to get to the mouth of the river here. This is this is true. It was a bit of a, um, a jigsaw puzzle to start with. Sure. And then the more we discovered, and then I discovered, and obviously all along the way I discovered, well, as you told me, that John Cage used to live in the house. <laughs> so that opened up another little avenue of possibilities. Oh, my goodness. Of course, Right. Mr. Cage, um, you know, could do anything really. Anything is anything. So that that was that was very good. So, funnily enough, after we came back from Los Angeles, and I then processed sounds and popped a new version of it all together with the sounds from the Schindler House into it, then I I knew it was kind of getting near to the end of what what I think it was going to be for a record, and. Then, of course, the penny dropped, and I went, I've got to take my fragments of the vessels and shards that I'd used on the recordings and pop them into a piano and then play them. So it's an unprepared cage-like piano. Ah, interesting. And that's what the, and that's what the pianos are in there, and that's why they're, they're there. And that sort of tied the, the whole project up with a neat little bow, really. Right. Well, that's it's interesting because... Uh, You know, in thinking in terms of your collection of all this instrument, all these, what you call instruments, I mean, there Mm. is that one spot where there's sort of like this piano and rough, noisy sound all kind of coming in at a shot. And I was like, yeah, uh, where, how was, how does that play into it? And it's, it's very clear now uh, what that that is. We ran the, the, the album from the beginning and I just played through once. And that those are the bits I liked. Got I it. wanted to keep it pretty minimal, and I liked the way that the, on the second side of the album that those piano, those two <laughs> chords really fall was kind of. I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. Well, it had um, a real drama to it for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does a little. Um, so then I, I was pleased with that the way that sort of rounded off. I have to say. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's why they're there. So those are the components. You know, you've got Vienna. You've got Edmund's pieces. You've got uh, the actual sounds from the house, and then you and sounds from LA as well. There's an aeroplane going over in LA. There's a fireplace, mm-hmm. a big copper fireplace, which is from the house. There's the bamboos in the wind outside. Um, little bits and bobs recorded in the house, and then finally the cage piano. There's like four instruments, really. Yeah. The, well, there are some things that though that sound like kind of almost semi-traditional synth pad type of backgrounds. Is that just more manipulated uh, sounds that you had gathered as part of the project? Yeah, or, there's, yeah. yeah there's, there's, there's no synths there, um, no synths at all, which is fine. Um, sure. Yeah, no, it's all, it's, all, it's all processed stuff. Interesting, um, interesting. The, the percussion-y type sounds come from... The, for instance, the, the handles outside the theater or the opera house, great, mm-hmm. massive, beautiful, intricate ironwork. And I carried around a small wooden mallet, which I could then uh, mm-hmm. tap and hit things with and make rhythms with and then process those afterwards. I, I tend to sort of, I also have a couple of rings on my fingers and I tend to sort of hit things with my fingers or with um, a soft wooden mallet. And that's kind of turning into a, almost like a, uh, something I sort of tend to put in my breast pocket when I go traveling now. Sure. Well, it's interesting because that that's what kind of differentiates some of your sound collection from what people would traditionally call field recordings, right? Because mm. a field recording is like set up the microphone and then run away so that the sound of you doesn't impede on it, right? Yeah. But, uh, what I tend to do is I tend to set up the microphone and then go walking with it. Uh-huh. Oh, that's so cool. my sound is always my sound is generally always moving as opposed to static. Sure, and it also is purposefully includes you in the sound, right? Yeah, I try to be as quiet as possible to tell you the truth. <laughs> mm. 
I mean, I did, I did, when the horses came past, I heard that from the Spanish riding school, the only, re- <laughs> for instance, the reason the horses are there is because it's a beautiful hat sound, but you have, they, they were pulling, a, um, they were just going for a morning walk, I think, exercising them. They're going through the streets, so I ran after them, but at some stages they're in rhythm, and then they go out of rhythm as right. well, and that's exactly what happens when you set up two or three of Edmund's vessels and rock them at the same time. Oh, sure, they're in rhythm, and then they go right. out of rhythm, so we set them left, right, stereos, and they're sort of brothers and sisters, but they're, <laughs> it all makes sense to me, logically. Sure, so so true. Now, when I kind of started digging into your background, I was kind of blown mm-hmm. away because you have, first of all, you have a tremendous body of work. Uh, between the number of soundtracks that you've done for, for movies and TV yeah. and video pieces, um, as well as your own releases, but then going back a long way, uh, to being sort of a pop star, uh, you have uh, a sort of not, a, yeah, a sort of not one. Thank goodness it didn't really work. In either, <laughs> in both case, in in both cases, I'd say if they were kind of the, one, the first one was just interesting, but uh, it was really dreadful music. The second one was much better music, but I'm glad it also failed. I have to say. Oh, really? Why? Why do you the say King that? The King of Luxembourg. Well, because I, you know, I think if I had a certain degree of great success, I probably wouldn't be alive, really. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I would that. just been too self-indulgent and gone totally over the over the top. Sure, right. Um, so, but I'm curious about your uh, about your background. How you got? I mean, you also have this background, kind of in a way back machine of having been an actor and stuff when yeah. you were very yeah. young. And it's uh, it seems like an extraordinary place to come from to sort of find yourself being this person who I would say listening to your work, you're sort of like obsessive about sound. Uh, you oh, yeah. are a person who dives into sort of like the inner game of the sound that you collect. And it yeah. just seems like a, a very interesting background to get to there. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, where you're coming from, where did you, how did you first get into music? How did you first get into recording? What were the influences that drew you into that? Okay, well, I'm, how old am I now? I'm 65 now. So, I mean, my dad was a submariner and he came back from the Far East with a present for Christmas, which happened to be a, a cassette recorder, which, you know, to a, I don't know, well, I don't know how old I was, 13 or 12. 13, 12, 13, 14, whatever, definitely not 14, so 11 or 12 or 13. And this machine, you know, the fact that you could record sound and then go and sit in your bedroom and then play it back, Mm -hmm. really started to fascinate me. And also, of course, I listened to the radio, so I was listening to pop stations. We had a station over here called Radio Luxembourg, which was playing the pop hits of the day. So that was, obviously, I did that. But I was also in, influenced by the fact that I was interested in the sounds between the long wave, all the kind of Russian radio stations, which would just send off sort of messages from space, everything sounded like. <laughs> and I liked the noise between the sounds very much. And so that machine then led me to getting a, a two track machine. And then that led me to getting a Revox sound on sound recorder. Okay. And I went, went with technology, uh, technology rather crudely ever since. I mean, I really am dreadful at technology. I mean, if somebody calls on the phone now, I won't be able to hold on, look at the message and carry on speaking to you because I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, but I, I know that my my daughter and my son can do that easily, uh, but uh, my brain just doesn't walk that way. And so I was, you know, the music, and when I was growing up, the late 60s and early 70s, the music was just magnificent, really. And once I'd moved to London as a kid, as a teenager, and... I'd accidentally started going to the Marquee Club where you'd see, you know, I mean, ridiculously delicious bands constantly. And I'd just buying the records, I happened to sort of, you know, once to discover the live music scene in England. That was very interesting. But a big breakthrough for me, funny enough, was Terry Riley's Rainbow and Curved Air. That was a big one. And then the Beaver and Krauss album, Gardvara, which is a beautiful, beautiful album. And I was kind of always... Once I'd heard synthesizers, they were very interesting, but I, I don't necessarily like them just on their own. I tend to like them as color. And so my thing really quite quickly began to be collage of one sort or another. It didn't, didn't really matter if it was music or sound, but that's what I do, I would say, collage. That's my middle name. <laughs> well, that's really interesting that you say that because I would 
tend to agree with you in a lot of cases, but also in some cases, like with some of your film work, uh, mm. or like I saw some of your test reels of things that you did for like BBC ID drops or commercials and stuff. Yeah, right. I mean, you're it's also funny, put yeah. in a position to have to do some really kind of traditional, fundamental musical phrasing and stuff like that. Do you, did yeah. you have a music background? I mean, were you... I did, actually. Yeah, I did. I mean, I went to a choir school, a boarding school um, with a very good choir. Okay. It wasn't just a total music school, but we were taught traditionally. And then I went to a ballet school, but I sort of, and I, I was playing the clarinet by then. But I, I had teachers who actually actively encouraged me uh, to do my own music. So that was helpful. They tended to hear me playing the piano and I loved singing. And so I sort of had a, I, I had a, a good grounding in a sort of contemporary, uh, a sort of classical musical education. And then I sort of went, went off on my own, really trying to avoid jazz as much as possible, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but was, I don't mind. Zzz, I'm happy with jazz without the jar. I'm quite happy with the music, but I don't need the the jazz. The whole the whole thing of jazz frightens me. Oh, really? Yeah. Although I actually, funny enough, I mean, I play with a lovely musician called Gilad Atzmon, and he's he's super jazz. But um, I, I have um, and pianist Keith Jarrett, I would say, was delight at one stage. I like I, I don't mind jazz soloists so much, but a group of jazz people just pretending to make it up as they go along with all those mistakes. Hmm, slightly suspicious and quite. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I find it difficult. I'm still, believe this sounds very odd, perhaps, but I'm I'm still I still struggle with Miles Davis sometimes. Uh -huh. Sure, I you think know, a lot of I think um, a lot of people do, and I think uh, because I think that there are different minds coming to the game of uh, of music and sound, and I think that to a certain extent, there are people who really want the composition to be part of the thing, and you know, a lot of jazz music is really oriented around a very loose structure with uh, a yeah. lot of freedom to do whatever, you know? Yeah, but it's all the counting that upsets me, really, I suppose. That's all the counting. But they do say, listen, we're improvising, but can you just play G flat minor for 14 bars oh, and yeah. 23 bars? I want you to go to B, then to D, <laughs> F, and G. And you go, hang on a moment, that's not improvising, but you just tell me what to do. Right, yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's why I have a problem with it more than anything else, because actually they do know what they're doing. Yeah, right. That's That's a great point. I am, uh, I'm kind of curious about, you've given me a lot of questions here, but I want to actually go back and, and talk about some of your sound collection that you did, particularly in working with DeWall's uh, ceramic work. I mm. actually read this beautiful article in the New York Times uh, where uh, somebody went and spent some time with Edmund DeWall. And uh, one of the things, what I loved about the article uh, I remember reading it, and when I saw this, I went back and I, I reread the article. And one of the things that they talked about is that Edmund really wanted people to touch ceramics or touch the porcelain, mm. right? And he was like, for this writer, he was like constantly like giving them pieces, you know, here, touch this, feel this, you know. is Was that kind of your experience? Was the touching of it a, a big part of the experience? <laughs> That's quite funny. Well, because for, I mean... <laughs> I suppose if you went to the Schindler house, there was a, there were some pieces you could have touched, but the others which were in glass fronted and back latrine, so you actually couldn't touch them. Oh, but no, really? to me, to to me, they're very tactile, and I think yeah, that it's very interesting how he thinks about his own work. I, mean, I have to say, um, I didn't read that interview, but no, he's a, I mean, he's a tactile person as a person. Uh -huh. he's, he's not a stranger to giving you a good hug and a you know hand on your shoulder. That's all. That that's all really good, even in this day and age of coronavirus. But uh -huh. sounds that you might have been coming up with yourself. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that, man. I have a horrible cold. No, uh, no, I, I believe in touch more than staying away. Um, I, it's something I've always done, and I've obviously been told off. A lot of artists don't even think about it. I think, or if they do think about it, they certainly don't talk about it. And you're ten you tend to be encouraged not to touch. You know, you have the sign saying "Do not touch." Yeah, right. Well, okay, but if it's you know a five-ton huge, great big piece of you know iron cast in an extraordinary ab abstract shape, and it's possibly hollow, I mean, why wouldn't you touch it and bang it? I just don't <laughs> understand why you couldn't be a bit more childlike and and sort of have some fun with it. Yeah, it's like, what could you do to it, right? 
Yeah, what am I going to do? Am I going to am I going to bruise your six ton piece of steel or what? You know, I guess it's so. I'm, but I'm always looking to obviously the sound because I'm just yeah. I do go around constantly banging things and scraping things and running my fingers over things, and it's just it's yeah. It, tactility, if there's such a word, certainly certainly is one of my my trademarks. I definitely like doing it. I mean, I just love the sound. I mean, the sound of dragging a small more tiny piece of porcelain over a, another rough piece of Chinese porcelain, these little scrapes. I, I became obsessed with the tiniest of sounds with Edmund, I have to say. But he's a cool guy. You know, he, he reminds me so much of Derek Jarman. He's very oh. much in Derek's vein. He's totally open. I mean, we did a performance last night of reading extracts from Blue, the Tate Britain with Tilda Swinton and Spencer Lee and Edmund reading. And as a trio, they were just magnificent. They just bowled through this poetry and Tilda and Spencer and I sort of just surprised Edmund with it. And he was just so up for it. It was great. He's open. He's got a great brain and he moves sort of, he moves with a tremendous amount of sort of unashamed agility for life, which is just tremendous to be with. Very, very Germanish. Well, that's, so that sounds right like that sounds like the kind of panache that's enjoyable to be around. Um, are you yeah. saying that that he was doing the readings and what you were were you like performing sounds and stuff or or is yeah, it... I, w- I was telling stories and I found some outtakes from Blue and I found a tape of a, a demo we did with Matt Dillon's Heartbeat, for instance, and <laughs> Derek doing all the narration. So that was a surprise to everybody in the room, but it was funny to tell the story of it. You know, the stories were fun, and then. Derek and Tilda and Spencer did the readings, and I just listened. <laughs> it was it was good fun. That sounds like that was amazing. Uh, so, like, if you're performing something like that, and uh, I don't know, do you do you perform much in general? Not really. I mean, I do. We're going to do something at Edmund Studio in a few weeks, but I tend to, I try to, but not not too often. I get I I, I get worried setting up doing it because they tend to be based on the dreaded improvisation word. Uh-huh. Um, and so they can kind of, I tend to set things up on the Mac. And then if I've got a piano nearby, that's handy. And uh-huh. if I've got one other musician to play along with, that's really good. Generally sure. one uh-huh. more musician is is probably about my maximum. I've or made two super maximum, but otherwise you just tend to take, eat up your own space. You tend to play on top of each other. Yeah. And I'm not really a fan of, just people um, piddling about and just kind of playing for the sake of playing. I think it's much, well, now I just far prefer to play with people and one's just much more specific about where one's playing as opposed to what one's playing, I think. But I do like to do it. I do like to do it. I like to do it with all sorts of people, but I'm strangely unrepresentative kind of when it comes to live work um, because people say, what do you do? And I say, well, what do you want? You know, mm-hmm. and that confuses them immediately. <laughs> right. What kind of music? What, you know, well, I say, well, well, I have to know what you want. Then I'll give you, you know, I can give, but you have to give me some sort of guideline. It may be financial guideline or it may be, you know, um, yeah, it tends to be a budget sign. And then they can say, well, for that, I can give you this. Or if you want a 10 piece band, that's going to cost more, but I want to pay people properly. Right. So it's all to do with all sorts of things. It's quite complicated, and it's probably I probably put my foot in it half the time anyway, and get my, kind of cut, cut cut myself despite my nose, really. Sure. Well, with with the kind of music that you make, though, how what is what is a doing a live performance? You say you you have a Mac and maybe a piano. Are you just firing off sounds, or do you have something like Ableton Live or something that is... Yeah, I use Live. Oh, okay. I use Live, and I load it up, but nothing's... Nothing's, nothing's set up like a song, right? No, absolutely. I wouldn't know where to begin with a song. <laughs> no. I tend to... I mean, I tend to... My preferred way is I tend to set things up so that I can start anywhere, go anywhere, forwards, backwards, upside down, process as I go along, Obviously, only one thing at a time because I hate using, well, I've never used them, these something you can put stuff into and trigger it and everything. I'm not into any of that. Right. So I don't sequence anything. So everything is, it tends to be a kind of organic performance as opposed to a mechanized performance where you know completely that you can drop in beats and everything like that. I don't right. really drop it drop at all. And so, yeah, they tend to be, they tend to be pieces which in my mind, I tend to have long shapes. And so it, um, I tend to know the kind of how performance is going to start. And I don't really care about the middle so much, but I do need to sort of know about the end. Right. 
Well, it's interesting um, you say the thing about long shapes because one of the things I was going to say of listening, you know, kind of like uh, preparing for this interview, listening to a variety of music that you've done is mm. um, often the thing that sort of pro provides the the backbone or the structure for a piece might be um, some things that are the way that you capture them. It'll be something that has an organic rhythm to it when it loops. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then you'll play those off of each other, but there's also over that, there's like an overarching, uh, sort of like shape to it as well that you must just do with a volume control or something. But it seems like that's something that you play with a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm slightly, I'm getting slightly nervous now you're saying that because it sounds like I'm going to be rather predictable. But um, no, it's not. I'm just saying the opposite. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Oh, that's very, that's very kind. Um, I do make things which I think are going to work, and I d have got into something. For instance, the other, this sounds a bit odd at the moment, but the, last week I was in Moscow, and I did a concert with a musician I'd never met before. The night before I was meeting this musician, I'd gone out um, with some friends into the street and I'd started hitting stuff as normal, recording stuff. And then back in the hotel, I made rhythms out of little extracts, which I know knew would go together. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I put them with a, a sound which was coming f through from the rehearsal studio next door, which I was complaining about all the time because I could hear the bass coming through. But what <laughs> happened was that actually the little piece I extracted had this bass in it. And when we came to play it live, I really pushed it and bought out it and re-EQ'd it as it went along. And it was like, a, suddenly it was like I'm in some sort of deep house club. It, right. was, it was very beautiful. And that had come out of the, this accident of something I thought might and might not work because the bass was coming through and I thought, well, we're recording everything, so I might as well pop it in to see if it works. And it worked better than I thought it did. So that was quite pleasant. Accidents. I like a good accident. Yeah, well, and I was going to say that one of the things that – you know, you say, oh, dear, I hope I'm not getting predictable. I mean, that's sort of the nature of that stuff is the unpredictability of capturing things and then playing with them until you sort of like their let their organic nature come through, right? Yeah, I mean, I do like that. I have to say the, Adam, the album with Edmund, um, A Quiet Corner in Time, is an extremely specific piece of work, probably more than anything I think I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I think everything is so well... Uh, we thought about and we've spent a lot of time doing really lengthy you know fades and trying to get everything right i mean it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination but it's our best effort i have to say but i'm looking forward to restructuring it kind of remixing it i've done it once and then i'm going to do it with edmund again in a couple of weeks time where i'll take bits and bobs and sort of it's not remixing. It's just it's just repositioning bits and bobs and sure. having a go at just sort of shuffling things around in a more abstract way live. And then we're going to break things, which I'm looking forward to immensely with Edmund. Can you imagine Edmund Deval dropping something? I mean, it's going to be fabulous. <laughs> There's a gallery, a uh, gallery owner somewhere going, "No, don't do it! Don't do it!" <laughs> right? Exactly. They go, "Oh my god! I thought that was worth it! Oh my god!" Oh, fabulous. Have you seen, there's a wonderful video of somebody in a gallery, actually, which is beautiful, which I recorded, I don't know, last year. Some gallery, I think it's in New York, and, and all the beautiful mirrored pictures on the walls, massive mirrors. And he just goes around smashing with a huge hammer. He just destroys these pictures. And that's his performance, <laughs> and that's his art, and it's actually really extraordinary. I don't think we'll go quite that far with Edmund, but um, I'm, we're going to attempt to break some things, I'm sure. Yeah, so now uh, Edmund was involved in sort of like collecting the sounds and putting together the the stuff that was going to be used in the installation. Was he also involved in putting together the album release as well? Well, I introduced him to Mute Records. Well, I, t I told him what was going on all the time because he's a pretty busy guy. Right. And so he's busier than Daniel, and Daniel's busy. That's Daniel Miller. And so really, at the beginning, when I went to see Daniel and just talked about the project, I had a meeting and he said it sounded interesting. And I couldn't play him anything at that stage. And then as, as the months went on, I was able to play Daniel, well, give Daniel lots of bits, a couple of little bits I was p playing around with, which I was showing Edmund to show to Daniel. Mm -hmm. and, and then when I had a meeting with Daniel, I mean, I have no idea whether Daniel ever listens to anything I give him to start with. I, I never ask, you know, there's no point. 
but but then at one meeting he said look he said actually you know well what do you want you know and i said what i'd love for you to put out this because i think it's going to be really beautiful i think we can really make something and we took it from there and then i took edmund the the mute book the artwork book right and he loved all the photography and all the artwork which everybody had designed paul taylor included poor a taylor the artwork sort of came together with, funnily enough, with Edmund and I, and it turns out that, in fact, I took the pictures on the front cover totally by accident. Uh, but we've def- it's definitely been a collaboration, but we haven't necessarily been meeting in person to do it. Okay. But he's been in, I mean, I wouldn't do anything without his total approval, and that goes down to the videos we're putting out and everything. You know, he's he's behind everything, and um, absolutely as close as collaborators he, he, as he could be, you know. And he understands because he actually has a great knowledge of, of modern classical music. He knows far more about John Cage and Weber than I do. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's a top dollar, really super bright person like Mr. Charman, and but doesn't boast and doesn't show off about it. He just casually knows the whole world and all that's in it, you know, <laughs> as opposed to I sort of dance around the edging, fitting, picking up things rather lightly. But so he's a he's a cool guy to hang out with. For instance, one of the things last night is I just wanted to put Edmund and Tilda together because I just thought it would be like, you know, smoked salmon and cream cheese or whatever, and they would just got on like a house on fire. Oh, nice. And that's what I like to do. I like to do that. Another thing about A Quiet Corner in Time, actually, was I just wanted to make a complete piece without scaring people to death because I could have made it really, really, really scary. Sure. You know, I, I, scary sounds tend to be easier than not scary sounds, I think. Mm. So I, I was determined to kind of keep, apart from the, the first piano crash, uh, it's, it's a pretty tame piece for me, and uh, but tame, and I'm still trying to figure it out. I mean, I still, I talked to her about Edmund last night. I mean, I still don't really, I'm still calling it a thing uh, because I don't really, really know what it is. And I think he could probably tell me what it is better than I can tell myself. You you kind of talk about it being easier to do scary stuff. Do you think that, that some of that is because maybe the nature of dimensionality, you know, when you're doing, when you're taking small sounds and making them really large, is that just like, is that kind of scary just because of the nature of it? Or when you're taking things out of their normal context, you know, because you did a recording uh, on the street banging on a handle or something, when you take them out of their context, do you think that that's just disturbing to people in general? Or do you think you have a particular bent in like combining things in a scary way? I really like messing things up. <laughs> <laughs> All it right. has to be said. It has to be said. <laughs> I I love I love a bit of noise. <laughs> I really do. But I, you have to be careful. I don't like a lot of noise constantly. Like I don't need to listen to forty five minutes of wailing feedback and right. synths and modular synths going completely crazy, dicking around everywhere. Like just like nobody's thinking. Oh. I I I like things to be sparingly terrifying. I suppose mm-hmm. within a landscape which is possibly not coming from that at all right. equally of course when it comes to film music i just love silence you know i love when it really drop away and you've got virtually nothing there and then maybe something comes in and appears to be nothing but actually it is something i love all that kind of gray area of sound where what is that is that uh, um, is that is that actually there is it what is it and then it becomes well what is it is it sound or is it music or so you know working with on film, you all have this thing about sound editors and sound designers and composers, and you know it's very difficult to fit into any of that. I find I must admit, which is why I don't do films very often for some reason. I'm a bit, as I say, I'm my own worst enemy, sadly. <laughs> I, I would say that that sort of a tenant of your of your music is that it it's very focused. So you don't have this scenario mm. where you have like 19 things making sound all at once. It seems like hate it. every piece is very intentionally in its place. Yeah, I hate it. Can't stand it. I mean, I think I probably used to love it when I was younger. I listened to back to some of my early recordings with horror, really, and think, oh, my God, <laughs> did I really put on, you know, 94 guitars, you know. Oh. And, I, and I'm, I really suffer, so I don't really... Uh, yeah, I don't really go go there sonically anymore at all. You know, I'd have one of the things I have learned, I suppose, as I got older to a certain extent, is less is more, and just to try and yeah, try and restrain myself. But if somebody else wants to try something and have a go at something, I'm all in for that. But I'm just certainly not going to go there myself. And I quite like to be part of a group of people who do stuff. Um, for instance, 
you know, I mean, I've, I'm playing within a group of musicians next week, I think, next Tuesday. And I know one of them, I know one of the musicians, or maybe I know two of them, but I've got no idea what the, we're going to play. And he's, one of them said, oh, can you bring the backing tracks, the freezes, we could all play again on, like, you know, last year. And I went, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I remember, ma- I remember making them for you. But I don't know where they are, what they're called or anything like that. So I know they've got them, but I don't. I, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to go along with sounds from Moscow. I think from my end. Sure, sure. Well, unfortunately, our time is just about up. But before I let you go, what is what's coming up for you? Uh, we have this release just came out, and um, I hope that people will go over to to mute and check it out. It's uh, it was stunning enough for me to immediately uh, get in touch with those folks and, and help get this interview because I found it a, an amazing piece of work. Uh, what oh. else do you have uh, in addition to these live performances? What other things do you have kind of on the workbench that, that might be coming up? Well, the, I know the next thing coming up properly is, I suppose it's a record I've made over the years with my children, uh, which is the album is actually called Savage Songs of Brutality in Food. And, and, and we've, we've called ourselves the Extreme Angels of Parody. And it's a sort of compilation of album of, of, of songs, which now I don't know how many there are. There must be about 15 songs in it. But it ranges from the sort of being, you know, squealing, helplessly, like rather, rather pain children to sort of beautiful children singing in Latin, doing bits and bobs. And basically, I've sort of just taken advantage of my children's vocal cords over the years, over the past 15 years, and done music with them because they're very vocal children. And I just thought it would be nice to pop them onto an album and an American record label was kind enough to let me do that, which is really sweet, called Sole Moon Recordings. And that's a nice little label who concentrate on actually, funny enough, re-releases of ba- music by bands like Coil and people like right. that. Yeah. But um, So Sole Moon are doing that. Yeah, Savage Songs of Brutality and Food. That's that's one thing. Well, it sounds like it sounds like it's uh, the opportunity for your children to have to go to therapy. Yikes! Well, I think they will. Yes, I think, <laughs> I'm not quite sure if they're embarrassed or pleased. <laughs> but um, that's the main thing. And then every two weeks, of course, I have my own regular sort of podcast, which is called Gorilla Audio, and that's through Touch Recordings, who are not a record label, but put out all sorts of fine recordings. And that, and that keeps me on my toes. Well, that sounds fantastic. I mean, uh, I'll make sure that I put uh, links to these things in the show notes so that people that want to check it out will be able to uh, go in and dig more into your work. That's very kind. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, Simon, I had a blast. This was a wonderful talk. I'm really, I really enjoyed getting to know more about you and more about your process. It's actually sort of like inspired me to want to sort of like chuck the rest of the day and just start playing with sound. I, uh, you're, you're very inspirational in that way. That's very kind of you. Uh, that's very sweet. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, it really has. It's been nice to have a chat. Where are but, you based, by the way? Um, I'm in, uh, I'm just, just outside of Minneapolis in uh, oh, cool. the U.S. So uh, kind of, uh, you're getting a lot of rain. We're still getting a little bit of snow here. But, uh, I bet you are. <laughs> but it's a wonderful place to be as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Lovely to speak to you. Yeah. Lots of love from Portobello Road. Ciao, ciao. Many thanks to Simon for having the great chat. Uh, he's quite a character, quite a delightful man. And it was so good to have the, the talk. Um, as you can probably hear, and as Simon heard during our conversation, uh, I'm not feeling so well. Uh, I'm not sure what it is yet, and I'm not going to speculate, but the fact of the matter is I'm having kind of a rough time of it. So I'm going to have to take a one week break. So there will not be anything next week, which is going to be, which will be April 5th, but, um, I'll pick it up the week after that. Uh, In the meantime, uh, there are plenty of back episodes for you to listen to. Uh, There's all kinds of interesting stuff to check out. So please do take advantage of that. Uh, If you have an opportunity, please uh, join the other patrons on patreon.com slash Darwin Gross. 
And uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concern, drop me a line. DDG at 20objects.com, DDG at cycling74.com, or darwin.gross at gmail.com. They'll all get to me. With that, I want to thank you so much. Make sure you get a chance to get out there and listen to uh, Simon and Edmund's uh, release. It's really pretty phenomenal. I really enjoyed it, and I hope you do too. In the meantime, have a good one. Bye.